I see various versions of this comment on all my graphics card reviews, other people's graphics cards reviews. Uh, let's go ahead and read it. This is a representative sample of a wide variety of common comments. So I swear reviewers go out of their way to benchmark games that nobody play. It's like back in the days when Ashes of the Singularity was in every benchmark. How about replacing some of these with games that top the Steam charts? And I wanna be clear, I am not making fun of this comment or these types of comments. I think this is an excellent question because choosing which games to test graphics cards in has a lot going on, but and there might be more to it than what you might initially think from your perspective and what you're looking for when you watch a graphics card review video. So let's address uh, these points head on. So for example, how about replacing some of these with games that top the Steam charts? And I think in general, why limit that to Steam? How about just the most popular games on PC? Well, there's one issue with that. If we scroll through a most popular games on PC list as of February, 2025, what you'll see here is number one, Counter-Strike, number two, Minecraft, three, Fortnite, four, Sims 4, five, Roblox, six, Marvel Rivals, seven, League of, League of Legends. Then we have Dota, Valorant, PUBG, uh, various Call of Duties, Monster, Monster Hunter Wilds, Overwatch 1 and 2, Helldivers 2, Grand Theft Auto 5, Rocket League, Rainbow Six Siege, Apex Legends, Delta Force, and Rust. Now, what you're gonna notice on this list is that the vast majority of these games are old, and the vast majority of these games are easy to run. And the vast majority of these games are live service multiplayer games. And none of that invalidates the thought process that if this is what people are actually playing, this is what graphics cards should be reviewed using. However, let's get into a little bit of nuance on that. Um, what are you trying to accomplish with a graphics card review? Now, there's a lot that you're trying to accomplish. One of the most important things you're trying to accomplish is to say that on average, how much faster is one graphics card compared to another one? That's one of the most important things to establish in a graphics card review. Now, a lot of people watching the graphics card review are actually more interested in, I play this one game all the time. How does it perform in that game and how does it compare to other graphics cards in that game? And the problem is that even if I reviewed all top 20 games for this particular month in my graphics card review, it's very possible that your favorite game is still not on that list. And what about new games that come out after the graphics card review video uh, came out and that, that end up making it onto this list? In other words, um, there's no way that a, any graphics card review can address your particular favorite game, right? If I'm talking to my entire audience, everyone who's gonna watch that video, that just can't be done. So that's why it's so important to end up with something like this that you'll see in one of my typical review videos. So in the 5070 Ti versus the 9070 XT, we can see this split on which one's faster and by how much and getting a geo mean of the 5070 Ti is 8% faster, but then breaking it down by other technologies. Like what if we just focused on ray tracing? Or what if we just looked at if there was no ray tracing, things like that. In other words, wait a minute. So I'm also looking at different features that these GPUs have. And again, trying to get an average result this kind of thing. So when we do this, uh, sorry, Darren, I'm gonna have to call you back. Sorry, getting a phone call. Anyway, <laughs> uh, all right, so um, lost my train of thought with the phone call. So when we do this kind of thing, a, a big part of this is selecting a representative sample of games to establish which GPU is faster and by how much. And the problem with, like I said, if you look at the top 10 on Steam or the top 20 just on PC in general, is that most of these games are gonna be running in the hundreds of frames per second, which means that you can often end up system limited, uh, 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 like CPU limited, things like that, especially if you end up testing at lower resolutions as well. So if I focused on these, especially if these are competitive games that somebody would play at competitive settings, like playing at low graphic settings, which increases performance by reducing the GPU burden, but also gives you a competitive edge, even if you didn't need more performance. Sometimes in, in some games, uh, turning down the graphic settings might mean that like somebody playing on extreme settings might feel like they're hiding in a bush and nobody can see them. But on, somebody playing on low graphic settings might have that bush literally turned off. It's not even there and you're just sitting there wide, and, wide open. So if we really wanted to test a lot of these competitive games, the way they would actually be played, it would often be at low settings. And now our frame rates are in the ridiculous hundreds of FPS range 
and oftentimes end up more CPU limited than other newer games. So that's one of the issues here. Also one of the issues here with multiplayer games is it can be hard to get identical test runs that are representative in an actual multiplayer run. So some of these games do feature a built-in benchmark tool. So I do try to uh, test at least one competitive title, and I usually grab the latest Call of Duty game because those tend to be popular, usually somewhere in the top 10, but also they're newer games, so you can are pushing a, a bit of newer graphics technology when you test it, but also they tend to have a built-in benchmark run so you can easily get identical comparison runs, which is crucial for giving an accurate GPU review you need identical test runs. Now some other games ha that don't have built-in benchmark tools have like a replay feature. So for example, for a while I was including Fortnite in my testing. I stopped. Now the main reason why I was including it was because for a while it was the only Unreal Engine 5 game. But I ended up starting to leave it out because first of all it was giving me massive headaches with my testing and second of all there started to be other Unreal Engine 5 games I could test. So what was going on with Fortnite? Well, another thing with these live service titles is, again, if there's no built-in benchmark, it's hard to get side-by-side -side footage, so sometimes you have to rely on a replay feature, which is what I was doing in Fortnite. But also, these games are often updated on a regular basis, and any time a game is updated, you now need to make sure, crap, if I tested some other GPUs on the previous update, has performance changed? Or even if you're relying on a replay system like I was in Fortnite, as soon as the game is updated, you can't even load the replay, even if performance hadn't changed in the update. So that meant that I would often have lost literally dozens of hours of testing. Let's say I have three weeks where I know a new GPU review is, is coming out soon. So before I even get the new card, I start uh, retesting all of my, my graphics cards in the latest games to get up-to-date numbers on the latest drivers and the latest game updates. But let's say Fortnite gets updated like every Tuesday. So maybe I have a chance to run 10 graphics cards through all of my games, then Fortnite gets an update, I wanna test 10 more graphics cards, I have to go back and retest the 10 that I had already tested uh, to, to now match the testing in this one. It's a massive headache. So that's another issue that comes up with this. But also this um, brings up uh, another issue which is why was I testing Fortnite again? I actually wasn't picking it because it was in the top most played games on PC. I was picking it because it was for a while the only Unreal Engine 5 game featuring all, all of the Unreal Engine 5 features. And Unreal Engine 5 was a big new engine that was gonna be featured in tons of upcoming titles that just hadn't released yet. So that's another big thing that goes into choosing technologies, uh, to choosing which games to test. It's, it's what technology and engine are they using? Which actually gives me a good segue into why was uh, why is Ashes of the Singularity being brought up here? So um, I swear reviewers go out of the way to benchmark games that nobody play. It's like back in the days with Ashes of the Singularity was in every benchmark. Now, I wasn't doing graphics card reviews back when Ashes of the Singularity came out, but I understand why reviewers were using it. And it wasn't because everybody was playing Ashes of the Singularity. Uh, it's because Ashes of the Singularity was one of the first DirectX 12 games and also offered a built-in benchmark tool so you could get accurate side-by-side -side comparison data uh, between graphics cards. DX12 is a major deal and knowing how GPUs might handle or not be able to handle DX12 or va various DX12 features is a really big deal because a graphics card review shouldn't just stand for, I mean, it does measure how does it stack up right now. But at least when I'm choosing what I'm gonna test, I wanna be testing the latest game engines, latest APIs, latest graphics technologies to give you at least some idea of how this will trend over the next few years. Cause you're probably gonna keep this for at least two years, if not four, five, six, seven, eight. So with that in mind, testing the newest technologies I think is very important. And that's why people were using Ashes of the Singularity even if it maybe hung on in their benchmark suite a little bit longer than made sense, once there was a lot of other DX12 games available. So, uh, like when I'm choosing uh, games to test, you'll notice that a lot of times, I'm gonna be looking into a variety of features. No ray tracing, ray tracing. Uh, if you look at my full full list on my latest games, I'll also be including like DLSS, uh, FSR, but we wanna look at the newest versions, FSR 4, DLSS 4. 
One thing I do in my reviews is I try to give actual side-by-side -side footage so you can see the image quality these things have. And I like to test it multiple graphic settings, whether that's ray tracing on versus ray tracing off or different levels of ray tracing. When I'm on uh, weaker GPU hardware, more budget stuff, I'll go down to medium settings because I think that's more like what you'll actually see. Maybe I'll also test out Ultra and you can look at what Ultra looks like compared to medium and would it be worthwhile to buy a newer GPU to turn up those settings. So the point is, there's a lot that goes into this, but testing the latest features, um, I think is important, but also not overdoing it. So w what I'm really getting at with this is, yeah, there was a reason Ashes of the Singularity was being used. It was a DX12 benchmark, probably hung on longer than it should. Should some of the top games be tested? I think they should, so that people understand that they're probably getting hundreds of FPS in these games if you're looking at high-end new graphics cards. And, but also, I think it's, uh, let, let's dig a little deeper into this. So should we just be testing the top games? Because I think that's also a little bit of an unfair representation of what people are actually um, uh, care about. Because I think it is absolutely true that some people just play a main competitive title, and that's really all they do with their PC. Maybe they just spend thousands of hours in Counter-Strike or Minecraft or Fortnite or whatever, and they don't play anything else. There are absolutely people like that. But I think a more common result is that somebody has a main competitive title they play, but when new uh, interesting games come out, they play those too. But then they finish them if they're a single player title, and then they go back to their old standby. Or even if it's a new multiplayer release, a lot of times you'll see games jump up into the top and then slowly fall out of favor. We have yet to see if that's gonna be the case with something like Marvel Rivals, for example. But the live service type space tends to favor games that have been long established. People might try out new stuff, and then eventually go back to their old favorite. But again, this also happens, like I said, with single player titles. People will play the latest big AAA releases. That's why they sell so many copies and why they can have such big development budgets. And now some of them flop, but a lot of them don't. But once you finish it, a lot of times you're done. Maybe you'll replay it again some point in the future, maybe right away, but oftentimes not. That's my personal gaming experience. I've generally been uh, enjoyed a lot of uh, you know old standby competitive games, but then I will play the latest single player games that come out. But then I finish them, and they, they're going to drop off this most most played list. But that doesn't mean that somebody buying a new graphics card doesn't want to maybe play uh, the latest big AAA release with the highest end graphics settings and see the the biggest visuals that that the PC space has to offer. And they're not interested in that. It doesn't mean they're not interested in that. It just means that once they finish it, they might just go back to playing Fortnite <laughs> or Counter-Strike or whatever, right? I think that's more realistic. So I do think it's important to test out what is going to stress the latest graphics hardware in the latest graphics technologies in these big releases that push all of those latest technologies. And that's also going to give you the best idea of how your GPU is going to do over the next few years in this kind of generation of big AAA releases. But that's why I do also test out some, just not as many, multiplayer focused titles. And when I do, I test them out at low, like basic settings using upscaling, because then you're gonna see that you're getting hundreds of frames per second. And you might be like, okay, this GPU is like 10% faster than that one, but like they're both giving me hundreds of FPS. Honestly, uh, it's good enough, right? Um, and also that I can then show that if you go down to maybe 1080p, you end up just being uh, CPU limited. So those test results almost don't really matter anyway. It's important to show that, but you don't want to overrepresent CPU limited performance where, where, and, and where we're talking about like 500 FPS versus 600 FPS anyway, uh, when you're trying to establish like on average, how much faster is one GPU than another. Anyway, that's my overall thoughts on selecting games. There's certainly even more to it than that. Like I try to do a variety of game engines to not overrepresent one engine over the other. Um, I, th there's all sorts of things that go into it. Also, if you know that one game is generally uh, overly favored to one uh, GPU vendor brand compared to the other, it's a good idea to make sure that you're not overdoing that so you have some knowledge of how that tends to go. Although with, um, 
Uh, with the latest releases, oftentimes if a new GPU generation comes out, you actually don't know if it's gonna follow the trend of like, this game used to be an AMD or an Nvidia favored title in this generation of cards, but will the next generation's architectural changes make that continue to be the case? Right, so it's it's important to to also be aware of all those sorts of things as well when choosing titles. So anyway, that's my overall thought process. There's tons more that goes into it. This is a fantastic question, but there are answers to why things tend to be done the way they are. Long story summary of the whole thing is basically, a lot of the most popular games are just gonna be CPU limited anyway, and or they are difficult to actually test in a like-for-like -like environment that's representative of the gameplay and uh, aren't getting uh, you know updated so frequently that it breaks all of your comparison data. That's a lot of it. Um, also, again, important to test the latest graphics technology, which doesn't tend to be in those long-standing live service titles. And again, I'm not sure that the top 10 most played, most hours played in a game is necessarily representative of the only things that people are playing. I just think that that tends to favor the games that people keep coming back to. Um, that's kind of the overall summary of the video. Great question though, and I think it's important to test a variety of stuff. I hope all of you have an excellent day.